Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial. This is a live stream tutorial on making a replica of the pretty popular doodle jump. So if you haven't played this yourself, I will show you now what it looks like. So if we hit play here, it's going to generate a level uh, with these randomly uh, placed platforms and we can move to the sides in order to jump on them. Um, this game has been remade in so many different versions um, such as Puppy Jump and yada 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 and uh, it's really a fun and classic game that I thought would be really fun to recreate in a live stream. So here is the base mechanics. We have some player movement from the side to side. We have the jumping on the platforms and the placement of the platforms and then of course we have the camera following along and that's basically what we're going to be making today. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So let's go file, new project. And here we can go ahead and choose a location for our project along with the name and we're just going to call it doodle jump please don't sue me and then we're going to click 2d and hit create project and this is going to open up a new empty unity project if you for some reason have trouble following along or if you want to just grab some scripts or use my project in any way all you need to do is go to the github link that i will upload along with the video to youtube so you can check out everything there. So now Unity has opened up so we are ready to start um, importing some sprites and I've gone ahead and created a few sprites to make them look like the original. We have the doodler person, we have the background and we have a platform and I'm just going to take all three here and import them into Unity. You can of course use any sprite that you want. You probably don't want to be creating doodle jump again but just using the same mechanics but I just thought I would use the original sprites. So the first thing that we'll do is take our background here and maybe change the pixels per unit to something like 90 just to scale it up a tiny bit. Let's hit apply on that and let's drag it into the hierarchy and now we should see that even when we maximize our game view everything is filled by this background. Let's also go and change the ordering layer to something like negative 10 to make sure that it will always be layered underneath any other sprites that we might be importing. Finally we can take our background here and we can drag it under our main camera and this will just mean that when we move our main camera up our background is going to follow along with it and so we're not going to have a case where our camera will move up and you will reveal whatever is behind the background. We really don't want that to happen. So now our background moves with our camera. I'm also going to hit save here, control S, and I'm going to save this as a scene called uh, main or main level, level one, whatever you want here. I'm just going to call it main because I save all the time and it's really nice to have done that now so I can just spam control S whenever needed. Let me just uh, have a look at the chat here to see if everything is all right. Looks like it. That's awesome. So now we are pretty much ready to start importing our first sprite and let's just get the doodler in here right away. And you can see he's way too big. So let's actually go in here and adjust the sprite pixels per unit to something like 200 maybe actually. Hit apply, have a look in the game view here. Whoops, the game view. Yeah, I think that that's a much nicer size. And one thing that I also wanna do is take our game view and dock it to the right here so we can see both of our scene and our game view at the same time because the game is often viewed in this very vertical format uh, with a very um, um, with a very tall screen size and not that wide uh, so I thought we would do that here as well and uh, now we're pretty much ready to start to add some functionality to this guy. So currently when we hit play, of course, we're only seeing a sprite here, but he isn't really doing anything at all. The first thing that I want to add to him is physics. So let's go in here and add a rigid body 2D component. And this will now enable physics on this game object. So if we now hit play, he's going to fall down. The next thing we want is of course for him to collide with our environment. But in order to, uh, for that to happen, we have to first create an environment. So let's go and select a platform here and let's place him on one of these platforms. So here we have a platform and I'm just going to drag this down here to the bottom of our screen. So he starts at the bottom of our screen and I'm just going to place our doodler somewhere on top of this so he will fall down on it. And uh, now we can select our platform and in order for a doodler to collide with it, we need to also add a collider to our platform. So we'll go in here, add component, and we are going to add an edge 
Collider 2D. Now the Edge Collider is basically just whenever you want an object to collide with a line. You can go ahead and add points to this line here so you can actually stretch the Edge Collider in any way that you like, but the Collider is not a box or a sphere, it's just a simple line. And this also really easily allows us to add collision to the top of our platform here. And that's really the only place where we want our doodle to uh, collide with because we don't want him to be able to collide with the sides. And we actually also want him to be able to pass on top of platforms and then land on them from the top. So whenever he comes from underneath the platform, here we want him to just go past it and then be able to bounce off it again so that's why we're using an edge collider because it's really really simple to do this with so i'm just going to stop editing the collider here now that i'm satisfied with it um, and uh, maybe actually i want to make sure that my points are using the exact same y value i just think that makes sense so i'm just going to copy the y value from one of the points and now it should be completely uh, horizontal Cool. So now when we hit play, we should see that our doodle still falls below our platform. And the reason for this is that our doodler still doesn't have a collider. So we'll go ahead and add another component here. And this time we want a box collider 2D. We don't, however, want this to fit our entire doodle. We don't want his uh, nose cannon thing to be stuck um, in on platforms and we actually don't want his head to collide with anything either we really only want to focus this on the feet area so let's go in here and hit edit collider and we can now drag this in here so somewhere along those lines somewhere around here and we can go ahead and drag it down here and just take the bottom part of our doodle we don't want to make this too thin then we could have collision errors so let's just have it be somewhere around here and now we can uh, stop editing the collider and we should see that when we hit play our doodle will fall and land on the platform yes all right that was kind of the first part of um getting some physics working uh, in our game the next part is bouncing and there are really multiple ways to go about this one some of you might think well, Unity actually has a built-in function or a built-in um, component or asset that allows us to define physical properties of materials. And one of these properties is bounciness. So we could go in here and create a physics material 2D, call it bouncy, and then in here increase the bounciness to say 1. And then on our doodler, we'll simply drag in our bouncy under the material and now we should see that when we hit play our doodler will bounce on top of this platform however how much we bounce is going to completely depend on from from where we fell so our current velocity and you can see that with a bounciness of one will always bounce the exact same amount as we fell so if we fill from up here, we would return to this exact position. And that might be with some errors because you can see our doodler is currently jumping even higher. If this is because of a rounding error or because of some of the properties of these materials, I actually don't know, but that is the general rule. So the amount of force that you hit something with is also the amount of force that you will have leaving it. But we don't want this. We want it so that no matter how hard we hit a platform, we'll always get shot off of it using a force that we specify, using a constant force. So instead of using this material here, we'll select none instead and remove it from our project. We can go ahead and add a script to our platform. So let's select our platform. Let's hit add component and let's go in here and add a platform script. And under new script here, we'll go and select C sharp and hit create and add. Now, if we double click this, um, it will open up in Visual Studio. And let me check if everything is right in the chat. Looks like it. And I think it's opening in my secondary monitor here. Let's go and drag this over. Cool. And the first thing that we want here is to get notified whenever something bounces on a platform. So whenever our platform gets hit by another object, well, uh, then we want something to happen. So let's remove our two functions here and let's go in and uh, create a void 
on collision enter 2d and you can actually see it wants to auto complete that here and if i do that it is going to fill out our entire function but this might look a bit confusing for beginners i'm going to remove the first word here it's not needed and in here you can see that it gathers some information about what we just collided with so this function on collision on collision enter 2d is a callback method used by unity that gets triggered whenever our object collides with another object Whenever this happens, Unity will execute whatever code is in between these two brackets. However, something that is often useful is getting some information about the collision that just occurred, uh, the velocity of the objects, what object we just collided with, and so on. So, and that is what we store here in a variable called collision. So now we can actually go in here and get information about our collision by simply going collision dot. Then you can see we have the collider that we just collided with. We have contact points. We have relative velocities and so on. So what we want to do here is go in and get our collider. And we actually want to get a component on this collider. And the component that we want to get is the rigid body. Because this will allow us to add forces to that rigid body. So we go in dot get component whoops, of type rigid body 2D. And we can then store this in our own variable called, again, of type rigid body 2D, and let's just call it RB. Now, of course, we might get a uh, situation where two platforms collide, in which case there would be no rigid body on the colliding object, or that we just collide with something other than the player that doesn't have a rigid body. Therefore, we want to go in here and check if RB is not equal to null. So if we actually find a rigid body on the, com on the object that we collided with, well, then we want to go ahead and add a force. So now we can actually go in here and go RB.addForce. And we could go in here and add a force in the upwards direction. The problem, however, with using addForce is that addForce takes into consideration the velocity that we are currently moving with. So if we are falling really quickly downwards and adding a force in the opposite direction, so upwards, we are, we are actually competing with our downwards force. And so if we are falling quickly down and then adding a force, we will only jump very slowly upwards. Whereas if we are only falling very slowly and then adding the same force, we'll then move upwards really quickly. So we're really competing with the downwards force. Instead of this, we'll go ahead and modify the velocity of our rigid body directly. So velocity is the result of our forces, meaning that if we set the velocity directly, we will simply set the speed that we want our object to travel upwards in directly instead of adding all these forces and them canceling each other out. The way to do this is by creating a vector two, we'll call this one velocity, and we'll set it equal to rb.velocity. So now we've gotten the velocity of our rigid body in its current state. Then we'll go in here and set velocity.y equal to, and this is where we can control the amount of force that we want our platform to give the doodle, or at least the velocity, the y velocity of the doodle after it hits our platform. And we can control this using a variable, so public float, and uh, let's call this um, jump force and set it equal to about 10 by default. Then down here, we can set velocity.y equal to jump force. And then we simply need to go rb.velocity equals um, the velocity vector. The reason why we are doing it in three steps instead of just setting rb.velocity.y equal to jump force is that this will actually throw an error because we can't modify a component of our vector without changing the entire vector. So we're really just getting the vector, modifying a component of the vector, and then setting it back to this vector. And that's how we're doing it. So if we now were to save this and go into Unity and wait for this to update, there we go, we have our jump force. And if we now hit play, we should see that as soon as our doodle collides with our platform, we start jumping. And this doesn't matter where we jump from or our uh, the amount of force that we're moving with before then. You can see no matter where I jump from, our doodle is going to land in the same place. Pretty cool, right? So 
of course, we need to modify this a bit to make it feel better. One thing is, I think the jumping is a bit too slow. I want this game to be moving a bit more quickly. So let's go under Edit, Project Settings, and then Physics 2D. And let's increase our gravity to something like negative 15. Now we have more pull on a doodle, which means that we don't jump as high. And we also we can also see that gravity works a bit quicker. You could also see that, that we glitched into the platform a little bit. And the reason for this is probably that if we go under our doodler, our collision detection is currently set to discrete. I would recommend going in and setting this to continuous, which should mean that Unity will use a different method of checking if we hit objects that isn't as faulty. So that should get rid of some of those weird glitches. And you can now see that we're just jumping on top of this platform. Pretty cool, right? So that is kind of the base of the platform jumping, but there's a very, very important thing that we haven't really taken into consideration yet. Um, and that is, of course, if we go ahead and make a prefab out of our platform and we go ahead and duplicate it and we move it up and now we try, now we try and hit play and see what happens when, okay, so this is actually working. <laughs> One second, let me move it down here. There you go. So now you can see that we are actually colliding with our second platform as well. We are hitting its collider, bumping onto it, and it's throwing us back in the opposite direction. This is not something that we want to happen. If we go here and take our platform and move it down so we can replicate the same instance, let's try and hit play here. And you, luckily, Unity has a component that is super, uh, that works really well for this particular situation. And that is, if we go and hit add component on our platform. I'm just gonna do it on our prefab here. So it adds it to both platforms at the same time. And the component that I'm talking about is the platform effector 2D. So if we go ahead and select our platform effector 2D here, and we use one way, everything is good. Yeah, you pretty much don't need to set anything up. The only thing you need to do is go to the edge collider and click used by effector. And this way our platform effector 2D knows that it should use this collider. And what this does is it basically says to our platform, if we go ahead and select one of them, that you only need to collide with stuff within this um, arc here. So if something is collided, colliding with our platform from the top, we'll go ahead and actually do the collision. But if it's coming from the bottom, we'll completely ignore it. And if we now hit play, we should see that we simply pass through, we simply pass through our platform. You will also see that it went ahead and actually applied the upwards force. So it is registering a collision, but we aren't actually colliding with the object. So all we need to do is go into our script here and check whether or not our object is coming from the from below or from above. And the easiest way to do this is using the collision dot relative velocity. And this gives us the rel relative velocity between the two colliding objects. And we can actually use this to say if collision dot relative velocity dot y is less than or equal to zero, well, then we are coming from the top, in which case we can actually go ahead and do all of this stuff. And if not, well, then we simply don't want anything to happen. So now we should see that this only triggers, only triggers not the first time, but the second time. There we go. And now we actually have the proper physics implemented for our character and our platforms. Yeah, that went surprisingly well. We haven't had a glitch yet. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. So the next thing that we should, um, and the next thing that, that we should probably implement here is some actual moving around of uh, the player. So let's go ahead and do that now. So if we select our doodler, we can go ahead and add a component and this component will just call something like player. Let's select C sharp, hit create and add, and let's, whoops, let's open this up in Unity. And this is just going to be a very, very simple movement script. So the first thing that we want is to get a reference to our rigid body 2D. So we'll create a rigid body 2D, call it RB. And inside of our start method, we'll set RB equal to get component of type rigid body 2D. 
Then just to make sure that there will, will always be a rigid body component on the game object, we'll go to the top of our class here and add the attribute require component of type rigid body 2D. There we go. So now we know that there's always going to be a rigid body along with the script here. And uh, we are now getting it uh, in the start method. Then we can go ahead and get some movement input. And we'll do this inside of our update method. So we can use input that get axis and the axis that we want to get is the horizontal movement axis. We of course need to store this in some kind of variable because we could of course just store it here, call it movement and then go ahead and add all of our movement code here. But remember whenever we are dealing with physics in Unity we don't want to do movement inside of update, we want to do it in fixed update. So we'll go ahead instead of doing all this, we'll create a separate function, fixed update. And this is where we'll do the actual movement. However, we still need to get our input inside the update. So let's go up here and let's create a public float called movement and set it equal to zero by default. We'll then inside of our update set movement equal to whatever input we get. And then inside of fixed update, we can go and set rp.velocity and this is where we want to change the x velocity. So again, we need to first get our velocity. So vector2 velocity equals rp dot velocity. And we're doing this the exact same way that we did it before with the platform. We're now modifying the x part of our velocity and setting it equal to our movement variable. And then we are setting rp dot velocity back to our velocity, uh, uh, velocity vector. So now if we save this, we should see that if we hit play, we are able to really, really slowly move from side to side. And indeed we are. Let's go ahead and multiply this with some kind of speed variable. And actually I don't want this to be public at all. I don't want us to be able to edit that in the inspector and I don't want to see it. So instead let's create a public variable here, public float, call speed or movement speed. Let's do movement speed and set it equal to about 10 by default. Then let's take this variable and multiply um, our input with this variable. So whenever we get our movement here, we, we multiply our input by movement speed. And now we should see that when we hit play, when we hit play, we can much, much quicker move from side to side. You will also see that we get some crazy spinning on our doodle. It looks really fun, but it's not really intentional. What we'll do here to get rid of that is simply go to our rigid body and add a new constraint to freeze the rotation on the Z axis. And that's all you need to do really. So just hit play and now our doodle cannot rotate in any of the axes. But you can see that we can control him and the movement actually works pretty nice. Cool. So that's the base of our movement, our physics, pretty much the base of our game's mechanics. Next is just generating a level for our player to move through. And then of course, having our camera follow him. So what do you guys want to start with? Let me know in the chat and <laughs> we'll, we'll pick whatever you want. Also, if you have any questions at this point, definitely uh, let me know. Um, let's see here. Things are looking good. Uh, so you guys are saying camera. Cool. Actually, you're probably saying both camera and level, but I think most people are saying camera. So we'll go with camera. So, um, this is actually really easy. All we need to do is go to our camera, add a camera follow script, and of course, open this up. And the first thing that we need is a, um, variable that references our player. So the target that we want to follow. We'll create a public transform and we'll call it target. And I can see something is wrong here with my autocomplete. So I'm just going to restart Visual Studio. Sometimes that happens in the new version. I haven't quite figured out why yet. So now we have our target and we'll just reference this um, through the inspector. We can then delete our start method. And inside of our update here, what we want to do is check if our target's y value 
is greater than our or the camera's y value, in which case we want to move our camera. Because if you have ever played Doodle Jump, you know that our camera will follow our player, but only when the player moves upwards. If he falls down, the camera stays stationary and it won't move with him on the x axis. So it will really only move on the positive y. And that's why we go in here and check if our target.position.y is greater than our transform.position.y, well then we're ready to go ahead and move. And the way that we'll move is we'll simply set transform.position, so our camera's position, equal to a new vector 3. And here we'll put 0 on the x, we want it to completely be centered on the x. We'll input our target.position.y on the y, and then we'll give it, say, negative 10 on the z. So, of course, you could also go in here and use transform.position.x and transform.position.z if you just want to be able to adjust that in the inspector. And this is a bit better to do it that way because this way you're not hard coding in numbers. So if we now save this and hit play, we should see that whenever our uh, doodle moves, whoops, okay, we also need to reference our target here. So that's our doodler. So whenever our doodler moves above the center of our camera, our camera starts switching or moving with him. And that's that might actually be clearer over here. So you can see that when he moves up here, he takes the camera with him. Cool. Um, of course, this movement is currently very sharp and we probably want to smooth it out a little bit. To do this, we can simply use trends or vector3.lerp. So if we go and take our new desired position here and store it in a separate variable, vector3, new pause, and set it equal to this calculation here, well, then instead of just setting transform.position equal to the new position directly, we'll go in and use vector3.lerp. And this is something also I also show how to do in the uh, smooth camera follow video. So if you want to learn more about lerping and exactly what's going on here and how to get really smooth camera behavior, definitely check that out. But for now, we'll just set vector3 or set our position equal to vector3.lerp. First, we give it the position that we are smoothly transitioning from, and that's our current position. So transform.position. Then we give it the position that we're transitioning to, which is our new position new pass and then we give it the smooth speed so here we'll go and create a public float call it smooth speed and set it equal to something like 0.3 and we'll then give it our smooth speed here if we now save this and go into unity and hit play <coughs> i'm sorry hit play here you can see that our camera is moving up in a much smoother fashion however we are getting a tiny bit of jitter you can see here that it looks like our Doodle is jumping a little bit in air. The reason for this is that we're currently moving our camera in the same method or in, in the update loop. And where we want to move our camera is in the fixed update. This is because fix, not in fixed update, I'm sorry, in late update. This is because late update is called late update because it updates later than the normal update method. This means that first we move our character in update and fixed update. And then we go ahead and move our camera inside of late update. And we only want to move our camera after our player has moved so that we don't get any uh, mixing back and forth between the two. We don't want to move our camera and then move the uh, player a little bit. And then we move the camera to where the player was before. And then we move the player again. No, we want our camera to always be sort of say behind our player. And that's why we use late update here instead. If we now go in and hit play here, we should see that our camera smoothly will move. That wasn't too smooth. <laughs> These sort of things always mess up. Come on. Yeah, see, this is not smooth behavior. I should watch my own video. There's probably a reason for this. I'm not sure I'm going to spend too much time debugging this um, today. I definitely recommend you check out the smooth camera behavior video. Do you guys have... Any idea of why this is happening in the chat? <laughs> Definitely let me know. Um, I think the main problem here is maybe that Vector3.lerp wasn't built for this sort of use. What you should use instead is smooth damp. Uh, and I believe that's part of physics. Physics.smooth damp? Nope. Vector3.smooth damp? Smooth damp. Okay, it's here. 
And this is actually much better for doing this sort of calculation. We can try and use this on the go. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we can transition to this. So our current position is the first one. So that's transform dot position. The next one is the target position. So that's our new pass. We then ref our current velocity. So we need to go up here and create a private float called current velocity and simply default this to zero. Or is this, nah, this is a vector three, of course. Vector three current velocity, and we don't need to default that to anything. We'll input our current velocity here and then our smooth time, and that is our smooth speed here. There we go, and this is of course a ref. All right, let's try with this instead and see if that works better. Let's hit play here, and I think now that we should get much smoother behavior. Indeed, no, god darn it. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> let's try and have a look at our player here. So we are moving him inside of the fixed update. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we are modifying his velocity directly. And so it needs, oh, delta time, that's why. Okay, so inside of our camera follow here, we need smooth speed multiplied with time dot delta time. And now, hopefully, we'll get smooth behavior. I think that was smooth. You guys tell me. I think it was. Yes. This looks much smoother now. And I think if we go ahead and uh, increase our smooth speed here, so to two maybe. Yeah, then it starts jumping a bit again. Okay, I think we're kind of getting past the way or past the amount of time that we can, can spend on this. I've always found smoothing like this really, really weird. You know what? I think it's much nicer if our game actually just, you know, snaps to the position. I think this doesn't get in, in the way of gameplay. It just, it just works. No one is referencing any variables. We can just save that, hit play. And yeah, I mean, this, this is the sort of behavior that we were looking for. I'm sorry about that, guys. I tested it before. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm recording and that messing, that's messing with the frame rate. I don't know why this is happening, but definitely go watch my video. It was smooth on that one. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But we kind of have to move on here. So, yeah, we'll get rid of the smooth speed variable. Otherwise, it will just be staring us in the, in the face and we'll be all thinking about it and... Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So the final part of this, and I thought camera behavior was going to be easy. Anyways, we're moving on. The final part of this is much more important, and that is generating a cool level. So to do that, we need to go and create an empty game object. Let's reset the transform, and let's name this something like level, level generator. Let's move it to the top here move it to the top let's add a component called level generator let's choose c sharp hit create and add and let's double click this to open it up in visual studio and let's quickly get past our camera follow script please please remove it from my screen there we go we'll cut that out in youtube all right so uh <laughs> i'm kidding so the level generator Basically, there are a billion, gazillion, million ways to do level generation in Unity and pretty much in programming in general. And of course, there are good ways and there are bad ways and there are mediocre ways. But really, the easiest way to do it is by generating the entire level at one time. Not procedurally as we go through, but just generating it at the start. And that's what we'll be doing in this video. What I recommend is if you're creating this uh, game here and you want to publish it at some point, is that you generate the level as the player is moving through it. The good thing about this is that your, your level will be infinite and that you will load in the level as you're playing it and so you don't have to store a huge level at once, but only maybe everything near the player. Again, this is, this is maybe a better way of doing things, but it's also a lot more tricky. What we'll want to do here is just a simple introduction to how you can use randomness to lay out a level. 
And uh, to do this, we first need a reference to our platform. So we'll go pl public game object. We'll call it platform prefab. We'll also need three other variables. The first one is a public integer with the number of platforms that we want to spawn. The second one is going to store the width of our level. So level width. And we'll default this to something like, I don't know, three. And then finally, we'll have two public floats, one for the minimum Y, and we'll set this to something like 0.2, and one for, for the maximum Y, and we'll set this to something like 1.5. Now, what do these different variables mean? Well, let's go through them as we start to generate our level. The first thing that we want to do is only gen generate up to the number of platforms we specify. And that means that we can create a for loop where we loop through, where I set to um, zero and we increase I and loop through until we've reached our number of platforms. So this will loop through 200 times. Then what we can do is go in here and create. So we'll instantiate a platform prefab. And of course we need to specify a position for this prefab. So we'll give it some kind of spawn position. And this is what we'll define in a second. We'll also give it a rotation, but for that we'll just use quaternion.identity, which means that we won't rotate the object at all. Now we can go ahead and create our vector three. This is going to be our spawn position. And let's just set this to a new vector three by default. Then right before we instantiate each platform, we'll go ahead and increase spawn position on the Y by a random value. So we'll increase this. So plus equals random dot range. And we want this random value to go between our minimum Y and our maximum Y. So now every time we create a new platform, we increase our Y value with, a, with something between 0.2 and 1.5. And we then instantiate a, plat, uh, a platform at this position, and we then loop through again. If we go ahead and save this, we should see, we should see that we generate 200 platforms. Whoops. We have to first off specify a platform here. And we have to set the number of platforms to 100 or 200 maybe even. 200 and we can actually give it a default value here of 200. So if we now hit play, we should see that we generate 200 uh, platforms with varying, you can see here with varying distance between them, but all on this uh, with the same X position of zero. And we can actually jump through all of these platforms right now. It's not too exciting or hard, but you can see that the base of the game is now working. And this is going to be 200 platforms tall. What we can then do is simply go ahead and give them a random x value. So we can go in here and say spawn position dot x, and then we can set this equal to a random value between negative level width and positive level width. <coughs> and this means now then that for every platform, it's going to pick a totally random x value. And you can now see that this actually looks like doodle jump. We get to jump between these platforms. There are totally random distances between them, which means that things look varied. And you can see that we can sometimes jump from one screen, one side of the screen to another. So there you have it. That's actually all I wanted to show you how to create today. I'm sorry about the little mess up with our camera follow, but I think this is really the um, core of what Doodle Jump is all about. And if you want, you can go in here and uh, randomize what platforms you create. If you wanted to create a special platform, say if you wanted to make this platform here special, we could go in here and change the sprite renderer here to a blue. Okay, this is not pretty, but just an example. And then we could go in and simply add uh, or up the amount of jump force to something like 40. And now whenever we jump on this platform, hey, we jump really, really far. So you could place these in random parts of the level and simply have them uh, function as boost in the same way that the original doodle jump uses springs. <coughs> you could also easily do something along those lines with a uh, jetpack. Or you could have platforms break in the same way that doodle jump does by simply removing the platform script and then instead uh, simply destroying the platform whenever it's, it gets touched by the doodle.
yeah and i think that's pretty much where we're going to stop for today i just i was sick not long ago so my my voice kind of stops functioning around this time and i've been talking quite a bit i hope you guys like the tutorial i'll make sure to of course upload it to uh, github so you can download the product there and play around with it and definitely um send to me on twitter at practice tweet if you make something cool using this system it doesn't have to be with doodle graphics or anything just want to see you uh, you guys using this that's always the coolest part but yeah i hope you guys enjoyed the tutorial part of this live stream and now we're ready to transition over to a Q&A format. And I'll kind of lay back in my chair here now and breathe and think more about or try not to think about why the camera wasn't functioning. I'm sure you guys will uh, say something clever about that in the comments of the video. But now we'll switch over to the chat. There we go. Awesome. So ask questions. Let me know what you guys are thinking and what you want to know something about. Will this be on YouTube? Yes. Lurk with Delta Time. I thought we tried that. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Vector 3.lurk with Delta Time. Maybe. I don't think that's the, the thing, though. Um, will this be up on YouTube? Yes, it will. Where's the object pull brack? Oh, yeah. You could definitely um, set this up using an, an object pull. So basically, you just. I think um, the way that I probably would set this up is I would generate all of the positions of the platforms. And then as the player got closer to the platforms, I would spawn the platforms in using an object pool. So a bunch of platforms that were already sitting around would, would simply enable them and swap them to the given position. So you could definitely util utilize an object pool for this game. And it's definitely something that I would do, especially if you're making it for mobile. So, um, yeah. Um, hello, cool video and streams. How can I make the same text colors in Visual Studio? So I actually have a video up uh, showing my Unity setup along with Visual Studio. Uh, the theme is called Monokai. And there is a Visual Studio version for that as well. And uh, yeah, it's really great. So you can check out that video if you want. It's called something like Brecky's setup settings, something like something along those lines traffic ai tutorial maybe not that might be a bit too specific but it, it does sound uh, fun as a side project what's easier for me to do live streams or video tutorials so that's a difficult question because of course there's not much um editing involved with live streams so i think uh, sophia has a lot uh, or things uh, things live streams are pretty easy on my part i think live streams are really taxing because uh, there's quite a bit of preparation today, not enough with the camera again, don't mention it. And, um, there's also, um, of course the actual doing the tutorial and that does require more energy when, when doing it live and responding to chat and trying to fix errors, trying to, um, and, and kind of the entire Q and a and everything. So for me, live streams are probably more taxing, but it's really, I mean, Again, we make it in one day, the live streams normally, so it's not it's not that bad um, compared to some of the uh, really, um, really uh, tightly edited videos. Um, how can I use light in a 2D scene? Well, you actually just go in here, you add in a point light. Let me, oh, I need to switch over here. I'm sorry. I always forget to switch the layout here. So main, there we go. So you go into, you're going to Unity here. You create a light. Let's do a point light here. Let's just place it in front of our sprites here. Then let's go and let's just select our background, for example. And instead of using sprites default, we'll go in and select any other material here. If we use default diffuse, you can see what happens here. We can also go and create a custom material here let's call it light lighted sprite and uh, in here i think under sprites we have a diffuse sprite and if we now use that for the background here so we'll use lighted sprite here you can see that we now apply light to the sprite and we can just drag this onto any objects there you go and now our 2d objects are affected by lights there yeah. So I actually have, um, I'm planning to do a video on top 2D assets. And one of them is a really cool one called 
2DDL, which stands for 2, 2D Dynamic Lights and Shadows, I think. It's called, I'm just going to write it in the chat here, 2DDL. And that allows you to do shadows in 2D and get some nicer looking uh, lighting effects. But I think you can do quite a bit of cool stuff using just this way of adding lighting, especially if you add some normal mapping on top of your sprites and stuff like that. But it does require um, a bit of Unity knowledge. So yeah, and I'll switch back into chat mode here. Um, do you have some tips for a guy like me who want to share a game on Game Jolt or Steam? Um, I don't have too many uh, tips for you there because I haven't done it too much myself. Of course, I've put some games on the internet, but I haven't really tried and market bigger games. Um, the primary thing that I did was start a YouTube channel. You know, when I wanted to make my first games um, and, and were, was working on a project, I thought, well, how do I get people to actually see this? And, and the main thing is you have to think about what channels are people using to find information. In my case, I wanted to kind of um, uh, do some videos on, uh, on Unity tutorials because I saw that people were trying to find tutorial content in Unity and there wasn't much there. So I thought, well, I could tap into this market and, and then maybe I could use, or I thought I would be using that to promote my games, but I ended up doing that full time instead. And you don't have to do tutorials per se. You can also just take elements from your game that looks cool, gifify them and put them on Reddit. And that's a way to, to generate some traction. So really just try and take the stuff that looks coolest from your game and, and place it in, in places where people are, are looking at these things. Um, will you continue your multiplayer FPS tutorial series? No, unfortunately that, um, series has been okay. Canceled seems very, that that's a very negative word, but, um, I simply had no more that I wanted to do with that series. I felt burned out um, with it towards the end. And I really want to do more standalone stuff. That's not to say that I won't do more uh, for FPS stuff or do more multiplayer stuff, but it's always going to be in another format in another series. I don't think I will be returning to that one. Do you program in other languages than C Sharp 2? Yes, I do programming in other languages, mostly when I'm working on um, website stuff. I'm really uh, fond of using uh, Jekyll, which allows me to program in, in simple HTML and CSS and a bit of JavaScript uh, or uh, jQuery. And um, that's that just works really well for me when doing web stuff. I've also programmed a bit in C++. Uh, not too much uh, C though, but I have programmed in Java and tried to make my own um, uh, small game engine in Java, which was a really fun project. So I've, I've tried uh, a few different things by, by now. Um, why don't you make a game publishing tutorial? That is a good question, again, because I don't have too much knowledge on the matter, but I could definitely look into it at some point. What about an MMO type game like League or Dota? Um, those are way too difficult, simply, I'm sorry. I'm sitting in my Java class right now, lol. Okay, that's good. Um, will I make a multiplayer system in Unity? That depends on what you mean by multiplayer system. I definitely want to do some more on multiplayer stuff. I, I hear that Unit has um, evolved quite a bit since my, my multiplayer FPS course and definitely want to um, re-explore it a bit. Um, but I haven't uh, planned on anything specific yet. I'm planning on doing more Unity tutorials on 2D games because I'm very interested in isometric games like Hyperlight Dri uh, Drifter. Um, I would definitely do love to do something with uh, 2D isometric games. I would also love to do something using the new Unity 2D tile map tools. So um, definitely want to do more 2D stuff, maybe for a live stream at some point. Um, Make tutorial on machine learning and AI in Unity. That would also be really, really cool, but probably not something that I could put into a single tutorial. Um, let's see, VR tutorials in the future. VR is a thing that a lot of people request really, but um, the problem for me with, with doing uh, VR specific tutorials is that I don't have a headset. <laughs> mm. So uh, if, I, if I get sent one, maybe. Please guys, HTC, no, Oculus maybe um that's that's the main barrier and then of course there's also um that i i think it's it's a fairly limited amount of people who own vr gear and vr dev kits and um i i think a, a large 
portion of my subscribers would wouldn't necessarily be interested in it but that's not to say that i couldn't do a a single video or two on the subject which i would definitely want to do um thanks for all the guy, uh, people saying that they like the videos and stuff like that i really appreciate it thanks guys um let's see can you make rolling sky game i don't I don't think I'm familiar with this one. I'm sorry if it's something big that I should know about. Um, how do you store high scores in a fully published games? There are definitely um, plugins for that, um, but I mean, you, you store them server side and uh, then it really just depends on how much security you want. Um, that's, that's my really annoying answer. Uh, will we ever get to play a game of yours? Well, I've made plenty of games for Ludum Diary that are completely free or an, uh, an available for you to play. I'm just gonna find, um, open up LD Jam here and see if I can quickly, very quickly, brackies, LD Jam. Hopefully this appears on Google here because then I'm just going to link you to my game library. That should be somewhere around here. So um, this here is the on the new Ludum Diary website where I've made a game called Shrinking Planet. Uh, that some of you might know about and I've also made some older ones like Dicking and um, Maniac Inc which are on the old Ludum Dare website so if I go Ludum Dare brackies hopefully I can also get a link to the old site I don't think this appears on YouTube actually um, but I have a few making of videos on those games as well so really just visit my YouTube channel and uh and uh, on there, you can find making of videos of all three games and links to play them. So have fun with those. Um, and also I have a video coming up very, very soon now. It's this Wednesday um, on my newest game that I made in a short amount of time uh, called Gombo that I really hope that you guys will uh, think is cool. It's kind of hard for you guys to play alone. So I don't know if I will pre be providing a download link for the game because it's meant to be played with a controller and i've set it up with an old ps3 controller and then multiple people but definitely hope that you will enjoy the video um could you make tutorials about game or sound design in unity i do have very few tutorials on sound and i should probably do more but it's just not something that get requested a lot i don't know i think a lot of people underestimate the importance of sound uh, when it comes to game development um when will you make a how to make a GTA 5 in Unity stream? How about tomorrow? Sounds good. <laughs> it's not going to happen, man. Do you have uh, a GTX 1080? Nope. Um, I think the one that I'm using is a 960. No, that's not right. I'm using an older one. I don't remember. Um, I also wait for the Half-Life 3 in Unity stream. Thanks, guys. You guys are really um, constructive about the questions at this point. A bit off topic, but do you ever fear of running out of content to make tutorials on? Or um, do I feel I may come to a point that I don't know what to do next? That's a really good question. Um, fortunately, I think I can pretty confidently say no. Um, first of all, YouTube and Unity and the game development industry is just moving so darn quickly there's always something new to cover. There's always a new feature, something that you guys want to see, a new genre, a new mechanic. So that's nice. Sometimes it can be hard to come up with ideas for videos, but that's mostly because we're always trying to find a sweet spot between something that we find think is fun and that we think you guys are interested in and actually want to see versus just making documentation on a feature that no one knows about or even cares about. Um, so that's the hard part. That's finding something that we can present in a really interesting way that you guys think is fun um, while still being relevant and, and while still being something that you can hopefully learn something from. But I think even if I was to completely exhaust every tutorial that is to make about Unity, I could move on to other software. So do game design related videos. If you haven't seen my video on, com on what makes combat fun, definitely check that out because that's, that's a completely different format with so, I mean, endless amounts of video potential because that's just thinking about game design. And that's something that I haven't done a lot. So um, the answer is no. Um, 
how any book recommendations i'm sorry i don't read that many books i don't actually have any good recommendations for you um especially not if you're interested in unity and c sharp and stuff i i think um the only book that i have read that that helped me in my c sharp programming was um introduction or beginner's guide to c sharp by jason lynn i think something along those lines one of the first books that i ever read on on programming and um that was really useful when just starting out but yeah, I'm not the right person to ask for that. How old am I? I am 20 years old. Um, and I think it's ready, guys, or it's time to kind of wrap it up and ask the last questions now. And we'll I'll try and quick fire these last ones uh, because uh, my throat is just telling me to quit at this point. So let's do the, uh, the last stretch here. Um, I would uh love more game design videos that's good to know definitely which language is better uh c sharp or javascript completely depends on what you want to do if you think about programming in c sharp or in unity uh i would i would always recommend c sharp but if you're a beginner picking up javascript can be much easier um, for you to learn the entry barrier is lower because it it uh reads more like english uh you're comparing c sharp to javascript blah 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 uh, can you make a ui tips video Good idea. Noted. Um, thanks for you. You were saying that uh, that that you like this stuff, and 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 I really appreciate it, guys. You guys rock. Um, let's see. Any last questions? How about making trading card game tutorial? That could also be fun. Definitely something with cards at at some point. Will you participate in the next Ludum Diary on first December? I cannot do that because I am at DreamHack on that that particular date. DreamHack was moved to the beginning of December this year, but I will be on in DreamHack Malmo from the first to the fourth. So if any of you guys are going to that, let me know on Twitter. We could of course say hi. That would be really fun um chess game tutorial could be fun I, i'm not that good of ch at chess so i would probably embarrass myself but i do know the rules so i could probably program it am i a complete beginner i am a complete beginner any advice practice and and do something that you have fun with and try and keep the scope down um i'm sorry to the guys that i couldn't answer i'm trying to answer as much much as possible different difference between unity and real I can't answer that in a rapid fire way. <laughs> um, Unity is better for very small teams. You, you, Unreal is better for, or it can be better for larger teams. Ah, that's not even something that you can say. There are so many exceptions and considerations to make. I'm sorry, I cannot do that. I should make a video on the subject though. Are you open for dev collapse or do you accept uh, projects? That compl completely depends. I, you can of course write a mail to me if you have something concrete that you want to talk about. I. I read my emails. A 3D tower defense while controlling a character would be awesome, like Sanctum. That's way too specific, but you can check out the tower defense course and put a 3D character in that if you want. Uh, how to spell your real name? Aspion, that's A-S-B-J-U-R-N. Um, where can I watch the stream again? On YouTube this Sunday. And uh, you can actually also watch it right when this is done uh, in the Twitch archive. Forgot to mention that, but that will be uh, gone in a couple of weeks. Um... Can you make a new series about FPS multiplayer? No, DLC tutorial, maybe that completely depends on your game. Suggestions, uh, we have talked about that. A tutorial on neural networks. I love neural networks. They're really, really inherently interesting. Maybe do something on that at some point. What is your best score on Shrinking Planet? I forgot, but that's a really good score. Uh, <laughs> and that shouldn't be allowed to happen. And uh, what's my real life job? This is my real life job. And uh, there we go. I'm sorry, guys. That is, why is the J sign? It's not. Espion. Espion. Bia. Bia. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, thank you so much, guys. I'm afraid we can't do any more questions. I hope you guys enjoyed it as, as much as I did. You guys are just, you're amazing. And I always love live streaming and, and reading uh, the chat here and, and answering you guys' questions. I hope you like the project. I hope you like QA time. If you want to support, um, the live streams, the videos, anything like that, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash brackies. I'm going to put it inside of the chat here now. So you can go there immediately. Now, here you go.
go patreon.com slash brackies it's a great way for you guys to support what we're doing both sophia and i and it really helps keep the channel alive you can donate any amount monthly of your choosing you can cancel it if you want you can keep going um you guys rock so yeah thanks for the stream guys had a lot of fun and i will see you in the next video bye thanks to all the awesome patreon supporters who donated in october and a special thanks to Dudeman, armin hans haftoon cole cabral superman the great james p thomas volley cyborg mummy jason the tito derek heemskirk fatal marify manolis nick lang aaron robert bund and peter Locke. you guys rock